Good morning from wherever you are and welcome. I'm Dr. Marie Lily Sarat, the Associate Director of the CUNY Haitian Studies Institute at Brooklyn College. Could you remove the promotional image? Again, good morning all. I'm Dr. Marie Lily Sarat, the Associate Director of the CUNY Haitian Studies Institute at Brooklyn College. On behalf of the Institute, I thank you for joining us for our May 2022 virtual conference relighting the crossroads, historical and cultural encounters between Haitians and African-Americans. This conference forms part of the series of events throughout the Haitian U.S. diaspora community to mark Haitian Heritage Month. We are thankful that you've chosen to be with us. To officially start the program, please allow me to, uh, to um, excuse me, allow me a moment to recite the land acknowledgement, a practice from my Brooklyn College community. We must acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape. We, the Brooklyn College community, acknowledge that academic institutions, indeed the nation state itself, were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous people. This acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to begin the process of working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. We also pay our respect to indigenous elders, past, present, and future, and to those who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Now, may I please ask you to give me the opportunity to provide you with a brief description of the Institute's work. We have a threefold mission. One, we're engaged in the production and dissemination of research on Haiti, Haitians and its diaspora. Two, we participate in policy analysis and engagement in scholarship that seeks to respond to the cultural and socioeconomic needs of Haitians here in Haiti and beyond. And three, we collaborate and partner with various community organizations serving the Haitian immigrant community to help them build capacity. Once again, we are thankful that you are here with us for the three-day conference and for a copy of the complete three-day program, please visit our Haitian Studies Institute web page. For these three days, Relighting the Crossroads, Historical and Cultural Encounters Between Haitians and African-Americans, we will explore the many historical and cultural encounters between these two Black collectivities, including the impact of the Haitian Revolution on the enslaved Black population in the United States, the migration of Haitians to its closest neighbor to the North, the United States, during the Haitian revolutions and beyond. We will explore African-American migrations to Haiti throughout the 19th century, Haitian and African-American cooperation in developing Pan-Africanism, the possible origin of jazz in Saint-Domingue and its migration to Louisiana, and inversely, the influence of African-American music on Haitian urban dance music. It is no accident that the words for music band in Creole is jazz. We will explore and examine the rapport between major historical actors in the, U in the US diplomatic history, Antinor Firmin, Frederick Douglass, and so on, the activism of African-American intellectuals on behalf of Haiti during the long US occupation of the country from 1915 to 1934, the relations between Haitian writers of the indigenous movement and African-American writers, artists, and activists of the Harlem Renaissance and myriad other instances. 
we have lined up some phenomenal speakers, scholars who will broaden, who will broaden our understanding of the ideological, political, social, and cultural cross-fertilization resulting from African-American and Haitian encounters and increase our understanding of the core evolutionary relations between the two Black collectivities. We are seizing the current resurgence of a Black, a global Black consciousness, consciousness, I'm sorry, a global Black consciousness to explore further the implications of interactions and intersections among these two Black collectivities, to ponder more specifically on how past historical and cultural encounters have contributed to the making of African-Americans and Haitians and how contemporary encounters continue to mold them. We hope that the conversation over the next three days will help raise awareness among scholars and the public of the existence, scope and significance of those encounters, foster among African-Americans and Haitians a deeper knowledge of each other's history and culture and encourage further scholarly and collaborative work on the historical and cultural encounters between African-Americans and Haitians. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce the moderator of our opening panel of the conference, Dr. Gabrielle Civil. Dr. Civil is a Black feminist performance artist, poet, and writer, originally from Detroit, Michigan. She has premiered 50 original performance artworks around the world, including in Puerto Rico, the Gambia, Ghana, Canada, Zimbabwe, and Mexico, where she lived as a Fulbright Fellow. Dr. Civil is the author of the performance memoirs, Swallow the Fish, published in 2017, and Experiments in Joy, published in 2019. Dr. Civil, a 2019 Rima Hort Men Ellie Emerging, Art, Emerging Artist, teaches creative writing and critical studies at the California Institute of the Arts. The aim of her work, she says, is to open up space. Please help me welcome Dr. Gabrielle Civil. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for those incredible remarks, Dr. Marie Lily Serra. Happy Haitian Heritage Month to everyone, and welcome to the first panel of our conference today, which I'm so excited about. The specific panel is called Haitian Women and Diaspora Spaces. Diaspora. Diaspora, jaspora, what does this even mean? A dispersal, a scattering, a people beyond their original homeland. In my own work as a Black feminist performance artist and poet, I had the privilege of working with Haitian artist Vladimir Sibyl Charlier on a project called Tourist Art, where we talked, worked, dreamed, thought about tourist art canvases, even as sites of diaspora space, the painting itself, and then also thinking about who was inside of those paintings. I don't know how many of you have seen many paintings where you have women, market women replicated inside of the frame. And I wrote in a, in a part of the long poem that I created along with Sibyl's incredible artwork. Tourist art opens to the space of the grid, not just the dense and rootless squads of women vendors with overripe fruit in weightless baskets, walking or standing one after another, again and again, peasant men and donkeys, Haitians, walking in place, waiting to travel to the money embrace, standing still, omnipresent, erased. Today's panel will attempt to redress that erasure by offering rich insights into the movements, writing, thinking images of Haitian women in diaspora spaces. We will have two presentations. I will read the bios of our two esteemed presenters. They will present, and then we'll have an opportunity to open it up for questions, conversation, dialogue. 
as the presenters are speaking, if something comes to mind, I know we're in a webinar fo format, so we can't necessarily all see each other, but you can sort of like create, you know, just write things that, that come to you in the chat. But if you have a specific question for our esteemed panelists, please use the Q&A function down at the tab of Zoom so that way we can make sure that that doesn't get lost in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm gonna start by reading the panels, the panelists' bios. The presentations can go one right after another. We'll open it up and hopefully we'll have a nice rich discussion. Our two presenters today are Shana Jean-Baptiste, who, who will be presenting on women, flora, and the archive, and Andrew W. McGinn, also known as Andy McGinn, who will be presenting on Haitian women in Baltimore, an immigré kinship network. Shana Jean-Baptiste is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of French at Rutgers University. She earned a joint PhD in French and American studies from Yale University in 2020. Her research and teaching interests include Francophone West Indian and Caribbean literatures, particularly Haitian literature, identity formation and gender politics, visual art and music, and Afrofuturist aesthetics in the Francophone world. She is currently working on a book manuscript that charts a literary history of national belonging and unbelonging and traces a genealogy of anti-colonial and anti-imperialist discourses in 19th century Haitian literature and history. In fall 2022, Shana will join the Department of French as an assistant professor. Following Shana will be Andy McGinn. Andy McGinn is a transnational historian whose research focuses on the legacies of slavery and emancipation. His recently completed dissertation, First Families of Haiti in the Transatlantic World, 1791 to 1880, included genealogical research of enslaved and free individuals of color in the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. The impact of this research was recognized by several grants, fellowships, and publications. Dr. McGinn is currently employed as the Senior Researcher and Program Coordinator at the University of the South's Race and Reconciliation Program, the Robertson Project. Please welcome our two presenters, beginning with Dr. Shana Jean-Baptiste. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I would like to thank the Haitian Studies Institute for welcoming me to this conference and also CUNY. Um, as a CUNY alumna, it always feels good to be back, even though it's on a, in a virtual format. So I will share my screen. Okay. So in 1931, accompanied by his friend, Zell Ingram, Langston Hughes arrived in Haiti and the pair spent the summer on the Caribbean island. Unlike other contemporary African-American travelers to Haiti, Hughes spent most of his time in the Northern city of Cap Haitien instead of socializing with the literary and political elite of Paul Prince. In Cap Haitien, Hughes and Ingram devoted much, much of their time intermingling with the locals, something for which the manager of the hotel where they stayed scolded them. These things, the hotel manager explained, simply were not done in Haiti by persons of our standing, end quote. Langston News quickly became aware of not just the color line in Haiti, but also the class line, which often will intertwine. Hughes explained that the color line in Haiti was ostentish, ostent, was manifested other than the obvious differences in skin color to the ownership or not of shoes. For Langston Hughes, it was the work of the disenfranchised and discriminated shoeless proletariat that kept Haiti alive. When Hughes calls the hotel manager out for having a shoeless mistress, the latter retorts, Ah, but women, that is different. They are young, vigorous, 
sweet as mangoes, these little peasant girls, end quote. Peasant women, peasant girls, not only cross the class and color lines, but they are inserted in a libidinal, libidinal economy where they are imagined as sharing the same attributes as the tropical flora of Haiti. Sweet as mangoes, they become implanted into the Haitian flora. In my intervention today, I take the series of photographs that Langston Hughes took during his trip to Haiti as a starting point to examine the juxtaposition of the bodies of Haitian women with the surrounding tropical flora and make an argument about ecology and US imperialism. I put Hughes's archive in conversation with the fiction of Haitian writers, Leon Lalo and Annie Diwa to argue that the teethering of Haitian women's bodies with the flora parallels a key tenet of, US, of the US imperial project, that the Haitian female body acts as a standing for a primitive land primed for conquest. What I will share today are essentially snapshots of a longer project that examines the practice of violence of the US occupation of Haiti. And before I continue, I must offer a trigger warning as I will discuss sexual assault and rape. The Langston Hughes papers housed at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library includes a scrapbook that Hughes used to collect and display the many photographs he took while, while in Haiti. Langston Hughes uses photography as an ethnographical tool to document Black life in the African diaspora. However, contrary to typical ethnographic portraits that decontextualize the subject, uses, uh, uh, includes a subject element in the photographs that he takes. The photographs that I have chosen to analyze all include women, yet the women are often barely notice noticeable as they often fade into the pan panorama. For the most part, no names are provided for these women. They remain nameless, ghost-like creatures captured, captured by Langston Hughes' lens. In the photographs, the nameless women are eclipsed, reduced to their labor, or consumed by the flora around them. Langston Hughes' labeling of the photos reduced them to their role in the country's economy as market women. In the photograph, girl selling milk, the Haitian woman, or the positioned at the center of the photograph, is engulfed by the overflowing grass, the neighboring palm trees, and the lush mountain tops in the background. In gourds of water on her head, the peasant girl's identity is supplanted by the nature of the vegetable she is carrying the goods of water become the focus while the girl, although visible, is rendered invisible through the titling and labeling of the photograph. During my time perusing Langston Hughes' archive, I discovered what seemed like a random piece of paper where he jotted down, I will read, Haitian foliage, mimosa, royal palms, oranges, bamboo, coffee bushes, ferns, geranium, mango, banana. Another piece of paper reads, Haiti, breadfruit, bamboo, sugarcane, hibiscus, poncetillas, flamboyant. A curly bracket placed next to the last three flowers indicates their color, red. A postcard from Haiti included in Langston Hughes' papers furthers the connection between Haitian women's body bodies and nature. Standing in a pond of water midway through the intimate moment of washing her body, this young woman turns her gaze away from the camera. While the bottom of, while the bottom half of her leg is covered by the vegetation, the rest of her body is completely exposed. She is both exposed and covered by the surrounding vegetation. She holds a cut leaf under her arm, a gesture that emphasizes the symbiosis between her and the foliage around her. Her misty skin, her naked breasts, and her bare buttocks become exposed, 
to not only the photographer's gaze, but also to anyone who will purchase or receive the postcard. This young Haitian women's bodies made its turn and transform into a consumer good to be viewed, purchased, and sent as a gift. She too remains nameless. In an attempt to identify her, Langston Hughes simply wrote a generic Haitian girl on the back of the postal card. I argue that Langston Hughes' archive reveals practices of labeling, classifying, storing, and archiving that we call colonial and imperial impulses to control and discipline not only the indigenous people, but also the flora and the landscape. Here I'm thinking of, for example, Moreau de Saint-Rémy's Description Topographique, Physique, Civile, Politique et Historique de la Partie Française de l'Ile Saint-Domingue, which is such a mouthful um, title. Right? And also I'm thinking about the many travel narratives that have played a seemingly perifer uh, peripheral but yet important part in various colonial projects. Langston Hughes' photo album also includes a series of portraits of women donning one could assume their best clothing. One in particular is striking. It is the only photograph that includes what seemed to be the name of the subject, TPH. Donning a white dress that we call the infamous flapper dresses of the 1920s, TPH stands in front of a white of a of a lime washed wall of a rural house. In her white high heeled shoe, her white penny hose, her necklace, her ring, alongside the barrette holding her hair on the side. TPH seems out of place in this rural setting. She seems ready, she seems ready to go to a jazz club in Harlem in the, in the 20s. Looking away from the lens and not returning the gaze of lengths and news, TPH appears uncomfortable. A vase of flowers placed on the floor next to her creates a parallel between, between the two. Like the flowers, TPH seems to be a disposable good used for the pleasure of the American invader. TPH's name is quite interesting. It is surely not her real name, but rather a nickname that had, that had been given to her. The addition of T in front of someone's name is often in Haiti a, a sign of endearment. Uh, pillage, pillage in both French and English means an illegal and often violent robbery that uh, uh, occurs during wartime. We must be reminded that uh, Langston Hughes' trip happened during the time of the US occupation of Haiti. When put against that background, Tipiage stands in her uncomfortable flapper dress, white pantyhose, and high-heeled shoes as a reminder of the pillage and ransack that the Marines had been doing for almost two decades. The only woman whose name or nickname is included is wearing uncomfortable Western high-heeled shoes. It is as if the shoes became an identifier and thus, as long as the shoeless people of the countryside remain shoeless, they are doomed to also remain nameless. But yet this photograph portrays and positions women of rural Haiti as marginal to the contemporary modern project. The dissonance of the photograph is a reminder of the US occupation's alleged modernizing mission, which foregrounded material and technological improvements targeting different areas of Haitian life, including agriculture, education, health, sanitation, transportation, and communication systems. These material improvements were contingent on the control of the Haitian flora and ecological systems. Haitian writers, especially those uh, writing during the occupation, used the juxtaposition of, Haitian, of the Haitian female body and the flora to posit a parallel, a parallel between the US violent taking of the Haitian female body and the violent taking of the Haitian land. In Leo Lalo's Le Choc, an American lieutenant violently snatched a corsage made of red flowers from the dress of the Haitian Josette Rinal. The scene simulates the violation and violence of sexual assault. The red flowers act as a substitute for Josette's sexual organs and the American men's gesture of picking the flower as a metaphor of rape. 
Anidewa's novel Le Joux also includes a rape scene where the body of the Haitian woman is once again, again connected to the flora. The scene takes place on the veranda of a Haitian couple, the Vernon. The American Murray, who's a neighbor, crosses the fence between his house and that of the Haitian couple. He finds Fernand Ver Vernon sitting in a, I'm quoting, in a coin distrait de la terrasse, ombragé de plantes grimpantes, which paru au colonel le lieu désiré pour leur étreinte qu'il souhaitait ardente comme il convient aux brunes filles de ce pays idéal. Telle une fleur exotique, étrange et captivante, elle était étendue parmi la verdure des plantes qui vacillaient, euh, où vacillait l'ombre tamisée du soleil. Les feuilles remuées par la brise se tordaient, se redressaient, montrant l'envers au velours sombre ou l'envers euh, ou l'endroit euh, luisant rayé de grosses nervures. The body of the Haitian woman blends with the surrounding tropical flora. Fernand's body rocking from side to side mirrors the movement of the surrounding foliage. She becomes an exotic flower, and it is precisely the exoticism exuded by, the, by, this, by this garden of which Fernand is a part of that acts as a catalyst for, for the American uh, marine. The bodies of both Fernand and Josette act as the metaphorical representation of the Haitian nation. As Nadev Minar has stated, sexual violation represents political violation. As they are both contrived by, by power, for the former, this power is expressed over physical bodies, and for the latter, over the political territory and body politic of the nation. The connection of Haitian women's bodies to the tropical flora of Haiti in this topography of violence reveals the interconnectedness of these different systems of violence. The taking of the land, the controlling of the landscape and flora is often coupled with the taking and controlling of women's bodies. To conclude, I wish to briefly return to Langston News. Uh, as have I stated earlier, Use, use, uh, uses methods, tools, and tropes that arguably recall colonial and imperial ones. Does Langston use partake in this imperial enterprise? Does he subvert it? Can or does diasporic racial solidarity disavow expressions of exoticism? What are the politics of visual representation of Black life in the global South when the tourist shares our racial affinity? What are the politics of visual representation of Black women when the tourist is Black but hails from the global North? Can we read forms of refusal in the photographs taken by Langston News? As I expand this project, I hope to further explore forms of refusal mobilized by Haitians through my readings of these photographs. Krista uh, Thompson, in her work on tourism and photography in the Anglo Anglophone Caribbean, has detected refusal through the transcription of what the Black subjects had or might have might had said. Langston News did not understand Creole, Haitian Creole fluently. If he did, would he have would he had perhaps heard a similar plea as those found in Félix Morisot Leroy's poem Touriste par un portrait? Touriste par un portrait, par un portrait touriste. Touriste par un portrait Kaila, Kaila, Kaila moi c'est Kaipai. Par un portrait Jadem, Jadem c'est Kaité. Par un portrait, par un portrait Joupam, Joupam, Joupam c'est Kaité. Par un portrait Jadem. Par un portrait pied bois, tourisme pied à terre, regarde-moi tout chéri, mal et nègre, pas gardé blanc. Is the tourist always already white and male? How would this plea be readjusted for the Black American male tourist? And I will end here. Thank you. Wow, everyone just put some flowers there in the chat for Shana Jean Baptiste. That was such an, an exciting presentation. I cannot wait until later for our conversation. And um, again, I'm, I'm gonna keep my eye also on the chat, but if we can drop questions 
in the Q&A, that would also be really great because when we get into the dialogue, I want to make sure that I don't want to miss anything. But I do see this, um, this question here and I will definitely open it up. Next, however, we're going to go straight into the presentation by Dr. Andy McGinn. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the SUNY Haitian Studies Institute for providing me with this opportunity to present my research. Uh, as mentioned earlier, this is part of my dissertation research that I completed last year at Howard University. I look forward to any thoughts or comments on my research, and I'll put my email in the chat following the presentation. Um, Baltimore was one of the many nexuses for Haitian immigrants during the early part of the 19th century. This was due to Baltimore's intimate mercantile connections to Haiti, which were supported by kinship networks. These kinship connections grew increasingly following 1793 when many Haitian immigrants found their way to Baltimore. While the number of Haitian immigrants that arrived can be determined, fully grasping their lives in the United States throughout the 19th century is quite difficult. Information on Haitian women immigrants is the hardest to find. To gain insight into Haitian, Haitian women immigrants, private correspondence has proven invaluable. This includes the Pierre Toussaint collection which features over 200 letters written by Haitian women found in the New York Library. Uh, these have been hidden due to the majority of researchers focusing on the more famous patriarch, but these women weren't focused on Pierre, as he predominantly wrote to his wife, Julie Gasson. These letters provide crucial insight into the Haitian immigrant experience, as well as cultural uh, retentions. This paper review their insight in the founding of the Oblate Sisters of Providence in Baltimore, the 1842 earthquake, the retention of traditional headwear, the madra, and cooking, the use of okra. These remarkable female networks remain underexplored by historians, but constitute a vital part of understanding the Haitian transnational experience. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to our cast of characters. Uh, Mary Rose Julie Gasson, uh, the wife of Pierre Toussaint, was among the estimated thousand people of African descent to arrive in Baltimore from Saint-Domingue between 1793 and 1810. While some were free, Julie arrived enslaved to the Noel family. Like many emigre families, the Noel spread throughout the East Coast, including Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, and Maryland. Julie moved along her master's network from Baltimore to Philadelphia until finally settling in New York City. Her emancipation would come through her husband, Pierre Toussaint, who purchased her emancipation in 1811. Despite her moving, Julie remained in contact with her Baltimore network. Uh, all of whom were literate, particularly with her cousin Fanny Montpensier, who arrived from Saint-Domingue during the Haitian Revolution. Married during her early days in Baltimore, Fanny became a widow around 1815. After the death of her husband, Fanny came into the service of the mixed-race Ariot family, who also arrived in Baltimore in the 1790s. The matriarch of the Ariot family, Elizabeth Ariot, was another contact to Julier. She and her husband Charles were a fixture within the Baltimore Haitian community, even being asked to serve as sponsors at baptisms at St. Peter's Pro Cathedral, that's recently after their arrival. As seen in several Latin American Caribbean cultures, a witness, sponsor, or godparent at a baptism was a prominent position within Catholic tradition. It was Charles Ario's occupation as prominent baker on Light Street, Baltimore, that led him and Elizabeth to be known by many immigrants from Saint Domingue. Ario's bakery was a premium location in Baltimore, as it was beside the a tavern called the Fountain Inn. The Fountain Inn is significant because that's where George Washington stayed when he visited. Thomas Jefferson stayed there as well. And it was also supposedly there that the Star Spangled Banner was partially written. Um, beyond the kind of white public sphere, it was also a place for those of African descent. And the Arios would be able to hear news from Haiti. And the visitors um, that came to their bakery, uh, they would share this news with their extended network, including Julier. Like Fanny, Jean and Mary Noel were relatives of Julie's, arriving in Baltimore at the same time as their counterparts. Like Julie's husband, Pierre Toussaint, Jean Noel had a hairdressing establishment, uh, which was located at a hotel on Utah Street. Like the more famous coiffeur, Jean Noel found great fiscal success due to the demand for French hairstyles um, and became a prominent member of Baltimore's Catholic community. Mary Noel, his wife, worked as a laundress. The final family that Julie kept in contact with was the Dussons, Sanit and Joseph. The Dussons had the privilege of seeing Toussaint family the most since they had a fruit boutique and they needed goods, so they traveled to New York City. Prior to this, 
Joseph Dusson was also a hairdresser. This shift in occupation to increase one's prosperity was not unusual within the Haitian diasporic experience, as seen Elizabeth Ario's son, Jean Elias Ario, who worked as a barber hairdresser in Baltimore from 1829 to 1831 before being involved in the trade of Haitian goods. And I'll be talking more about him in a bit. Um, so from these correspondence, Juliet was able to get insight uh, within what was occurring in the Baltimore community, but also provides insight into the connections and the conversations that are happening throughout the diaspora. Two examples of this is the founding of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, a Catholic institute uh, founded by Haitians, and the transnational repercussions of the Haitian earthquake in 1842. Following the death of Charles Ario, Elizabeth Ario and Fanny Montpensier, who took care of her children, moved closer to the Haitian community at the St. Mary's Seminary. Due to her prominence in the community, as well as her wealth, Elizabeth Ario was asked to be part of the founding of the Blake Sisters of Providence in 1828 by her friends and possible relatives, Elizabeth Lang and Marie Mangdel Bala. Her donation, as well as subscriptions provided by her friends, including the Toussaint's in New York, allowed for the school to thrive, so much so that John and Mary, um, Noel's daughter, joined the order in the 1850s. Beyond Elizabeth Ario, Fanny would continually keep the Toussaint's updated on the progress of that order, beginning in October of 1829, where she writes, I inform you with great satisfaction that our convert is uh, prospering, and so many people would like to join the order. There is so much happiness and to finally find a good establishment for people of color. While most of the news was tied to requests for donations, the Toussaint's would be alerted of sisters joining the order, members passing away, fairs to raise money, as well as major Catholic events. These notifications display the importance of the Catholic Church within the Haitian immigrant community. Due to the Catholic Church being an international institution, wherever displaced Haitians found themselves, they used this institution to find other Haitians, or at the very least, a shared community of language and faith. Beyond this kind of shared community of language and faith, these Haitian diaspora also led to news of major events that affected everyone. This is seen through the discussion of the Haitian earthquake. The Toussaint family had multiple connections in Haiti, including Elizabeth Ario's youngest son, Elie Ario. Elie had visited the Toussaint several times before moving to Capacion in December of 1840. The reason he chose the move was due to the harsh restrictions on those of African descent following uh, Nat Turner's rebellion and the laws that followed those restrictions, especially in Maryland, as well as his wife Georgiana's parents and friends who offered to support their trading business and who reside in Capacion. However, a few years later after they moved, the, Haitian, the massive earthquake occurred in Haiti on May 7th, 1842. The epicenter was their home in Capacion. Approximately half the residents between 4,000 and 6,000 died and the aftershocks continued throughout the weekend. News of the earthquake and the devastation in its wake spread rapidly throughout the Atlantic world. The names of the lost, dead, and hard, uh, dying were harder to find though. Fanny informed Juliet that the Baltimore community had learned the earthquake from the newspaper and they were anxious to hear of our acquaintances and friends who are there, especially in Capacion. After not receiving news from friends and family for three months, Fanny started sending letters from the Baltimore community to Toussaint, asking Pierre to recommend letters to a captain bound for Port-au-Prince or Capacion. In addition, Fanny requested Juliet to find any person who, who had arrived from Capacion in New York who could give specific news of Ellie, adding, no matter what, let me know what you can. We are very worried. This request was due to the Baltimore community realizing that after the 1830s, New York City had a stronger trade connection with Haiti, resulting in people and correspondents arriving there quicker. They finally received news on February 18, 1843, that Ellie and his family had been at the earthquake's epicenter. While they survived the initial quake, they fled without resources. This led to Jordana dying on September 23rd, 1842. Ellie, now taking care of his children, would continue to reside in Capacion for the remainder of his days. This network, though, proved invaluable as Fanny would continue to ask the Toussaint family to assist in correspondence, passage, as well as help finding jobs for those who wish to return to Haiti. In addition to these ideas of events, within these letters, there is discussions of diasporic cultural attentions. 
the first, the madras, uh, cloth clothing, as well as the second being gumbo and its main ingredient, okra. These items would be exchanged between New York City and Baltimore, depending upon the need. Um, upon their arrival in the United States, both Fanny and Julier noted that there was a demand for madras among their mutual acquaintances. The madras was consumed by the French Caribbean uh, and was solely made of cotton. This checkered linen, often red, white, red, and pink cloth, or a cotton silk blend, was used for headscarves, dresses, skirts, and handkerchiefs. This item was a product of the transatlantic commerce, first being brought into the French Caribbean by the French East Indian Company. This item, however, was not as available in Baltimore as it had been in Saint-Domingue. As a result, a business venture was born. Uh, Juliet and Fanny uh, Montpensier would use their connections. Juliet having access to the biggest port in the world, New York City, would send Fanny items in demand in Baltimore, which she would then resell. With these rare items from New York, Fanny was able to sell them and make a profit for herself in Juliet. Historian Carolyn Tumach confirms that Fanny and Juliet were correct in their assumption, as the madras were in demand throughout the 19th century. The madras and other headscarves continued to be in vogue in the United States, but they came in and out of women's fashion. This was due to clothes being used as a social marker. For example, it was deemed socially improper for women of all classes to venture out of the house bareheaded. This was particularly true for the free and enslaved community who often wore hats, bonnets, day caps, and headscarves at weddings, Christmases, and Sunday services. Since it was more expensive, the madras though became a distinction that separated free people of color from those enslaved within the public sphere. This high cost led to frustration for Fanny as she relates to Julier that people do not have a taste for it in, uh, in this country, aside from those with fashionable taste. Social anthropologist Michel L. Laguerre, S. Laguerre notes that Haitian immigrants maintain connections as well as identity through visitation, the constant sending of gifts and letters. Of the gifts that the Toussaint family sent, Julia's gumbo was preferred. Julia's gumbo was a recipe she learned from her mother, Claudine Gaston, as they served the Noel family as domestic servants. After the emancipation and marriage to Pierre, Julia made crocs and jars of gumbo, placed them in a package along with sacks of seasoning, and sent them throughout the Toussaint's network in the Americas and France. However, the main ingredient for gumbo, okra, was harder to find in the markets of New York City. As a result, Julia turned to her Baltimore community for this crucial ingredient, mainly Fanny Montpensier. Julia's gumbo was uh, supported by Fanny's okra is an example of the cultural retention within the African diaspora. The dish gumbo and its main ingredient okra has roots within West African diet. In the version that Julia created was a product of the slave trade, uh, particularly the rue that is predominantly found in Louisiana. Julia was one of the few that made it in New York City. In the wake of the Haitian Revolution, the culinary culture of immigrants from Saint Domaine in Maryland pushed okra to be grown in the region. By the 1830s, when Juliet first asked for the product, okra was heavily featured in the Baltimore market. However, Fanny's correspondence with Juliet displays the multiple complications of getting okra to her, including if there was okra at the market, if it was a good season or not, as well as if friends were going to New York City. It was in September of 1844 that Pierre Toussaint asked okra, uh, Fanny for okra for the first time. Out of respect and trying to impress Pierre, Fanny brought as much as she could. However, Fanny did not have anyone from the non-kid network traveling to New York City that month. The issue is that Fanny had been sending letters and correspondence and goods through mutual friends. However, out of respect for the Toussaint family, uh, Fanny used traditional means of shipment for the first time, sending okra via the railway. Due to both of their inexperience using this method, Fanny instructed Julier to show her letter at the mail depot immediately after she received it, and you would find a wrapped cardboard box with okra inside. Due to Pierre Toussaint's taste for okra, the food item was the Baltimore community's way of assisting him to grieve following Julier's death in 1851. Fanny, on behalf of the Baltimore community, wrote to Pierre, my dear friend, we, the Dusson, the Noel families, sincerely share your sorrow and feel the same irreparable loss. The Baltimore community sent with him, uh, with the letter, two small jars of jam, one of quiche and peaches, a little okra and a little corn flour. Due to Pierre's partiality to okra 
and not having Juliet to assist him, Fanny reminded him to not leave the okra in the bag, but immediately put it in a well-stocked jar and in a dry place. If you plan to keep it for a while, because if the remains, if it stays in the cloth bag, the humidity will attract worms. These are only a few examples of how Haitian immigrants in the United States related to each other. As more and more correspondence is found, like within the Pierre Toussaint collection or rediscovered, more information on American Haitian connections can be explored, as well as further information on the Haitian immigre experience and cultural retentions. It is my hope that these remarkable female networks are further explored by historians, since they constitute a vital part of understanding the Haitian transnational experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andy McGinn. And definitely, um, as we did before, feel free to drop you know, your roses, your, your, your thoughts, your responses to this rich presentation. I loved hearing about these, these women sort of trading recipes and ideas for gumbo. I just love, I mean, that's so amazing, the things that you can find in the archive. Um, I see that there's, there are some questions in the chat and there are also um, at least one question in the Q&A. And so I definitely will have an opportunity to open that up. I also see that someone has asked if we can place the names of our panelists also into the chat. So if you don't mind panelists, if you don't mind typing in your own names in the chat, I know that when you put your cursor over a person's name, you can see it on Zoom, but just on the record, I know different people are coming in different devices, so that can be helpful. And before we open up to some of the questions that are already there, I just want to thank you again both for sharing your work and also identify a couple of things that came up listening to the two presentations together. It seems to me as we consider Haitian women in diaspora spaces, it's important for us to think about kind of who was constituting the space, what is the nature of that space, um, how are Haitian women's lives documented in diaspora space, who is the person or how is that representation created and circulated, and in general, like how do Haitian women enter into public space at all and into the public record? That seems to be something that is coming up for both of you and the difference between um, someone like Hughes, who for me has always been like, I mean, because I, I, I'm i both of Haitian and African-American ancestry. So Hughes for me has always been like a heroic figure and someone who attempts to bring together the two aspects of my own background, but, what does it mean then for a knowledge of Haiti for many, especially African-American people to come from someone who is not Haitian and really to take that as a question very seriously, I really appreciate that. In contrast to what Andy, I'm hearing you or Dr. McGinn, what I'm hearing you say in terms of what does it mean to actually take seriously the letters and the correspondence that these women had with each other. So just thinking about that as a kind of contrasting way to consider Haitian women in diaspora spaces, that seems important to note. I also think, and this will help bring us into the questions that are in the chat, who or what is a tourist? That is a question I myself, in terms of the project I worked with, with Vladimir Sibyl Chalier, I'm very interested in that. Who or what is a tourist? That's a question. What does it mean to have a, like a romantic project or to think of Haiti as a part of romanticism or romanticizing, um, idealizing a kind of black um, African, post-African heritage through the diaspora, which seems to me a, a be also a project of the Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro movement and negritude and negrismo, all of those things. How does that romanticism as a project relate to, you know, sort of the imperial project, the colonial project, the project of ultimately occupying Haiti from 1915 to 1934? That's a question that got raised for me um, for your presentation, Shana. And then I was thinking in your presentation as well, Andy, there is interesting to think about like what makes a community network? 
what is ultimately, what was ultimately required for that strong diasporic network to exist there? Was it because um, Toussaint himself was so successful? Like what really allowed for that to exist? So those are my first kind of two questions. And if you don't mind either one of you um, or both of you just touching on that, and then we can get into the questions in the, in the chat and in the Q&A. All right, thank you so much, uh, Gabrielle. Um, and your question of who and what is a tourist is exactly the one that I'm grappling with. And does the, the tourism, is it, is it always, um, can it be a, 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 a naive, a, a unproblematic, just an act, uh, unproblematic act, or does it always have to involve um, a power dynamics, especially when you have uh, the tourists coming from uh, what is a global North um, imperial uh, power? And yes, to your second question, my answer would, be of the idea, especially, okay, we're talking about the 1930s. There was, uh, what, two decades after the, the African, um, Pan-Africanism really started with the conference. So the idea of like the African diaspora, the, uni the unification of the uh, African diaspora against colonialism, against um, imperialism is important. And Haiti is crucial in that project, and that started already since 1804 and throughout the 19th century, Haiti as the, the only uh, independent, Black independent nation in the, in the Americas. And when the, Cong the Pan-African Congress uh, happened in 1902, early 1900, it was Haiti, um, Haiti, Ethiopia, and Liberia who were sovereign Black states. So Haiti was always important in that Pan-African project, but then the African diaspora was never a monolith, was never, is never, will never be a monolith. monolith. So there is always a um, specific lived ex experience that, that uh, for African-Americans mean having um, lived inside the, the, in the belly of the, of the, of the American empire, something that the uh, Haitians, even though we, we did experience imperialism, it was coming from the outside. We were never inside of the beast. So that's a different, that, that's a power dynamic that we, we, we don't share. That's an experience that we don't share, even though we are, we share this racial solidarity, right? Pan-Africanism, but no, we don't understand this, right? We're not, looking at it from the same um, point of view. And of course, the, the, the colonial map that, that was um, created, Haiti was col originally co colonized by the French. So there is the, the language barrier. And uh, during the early uh, 20th century, 19th century, um, if you look at the writing, writings by Haitian uh, the Haitian writers, the, the way they understood, especially the elite writers, of course, the way they understood African-Americans, it, it, it really highlights the, the, the disparities within the African diaspora. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. So fascinating. There's so much more to say, but yeah. But Andy, what are your thoughts? Um, thank you so much. And, and Shauna's paper is also fascinating. Um, and discussing imperialism is something I discuss in other chapters and kind of how do we define imperialism uh, and colonialism. But for the question regarding community networks and how do you define a community network, I think really for Juliet and Pierre, um, it's kinship, uh, primarily through familial ties and I think Pierre Toussaint's, I mean, he's worth in 1830, $900,000 at the time uh, due to his uh, real estate investments and other things as well. Uh, so people are writing him for money, white and black, uh, throughout the diaspora and even in France. Um, but when it comes to this Baltimore community, it's really this kinship Catholic network um, that's very informal because these are people only one time does they do they use official postal channels. It's really, I have a friend going to visit uh, Philadelphia and New York to visit these other Haitian communities. Do you have letters to pass along? 
And I think this is something where the Pierre Toussaint collection is marvelous, that it shows that this informal network was alive and well, because people just go, well, we don't have letters, so there wasn't a connection, when in fact there was a collection. And it's mainly women that are doing this network, literate women who received minimal education prior to the revolution. Um, a couple of follow-ups there. One, one wonderful audience member just wanted to ask, when exactly did Marie-Juliette Gaston arrive in Baltimore? That's a, um, a tough question to answer. Um, my estimation is between 1791 and 1793. I do not have the official date, unfortunately. Okay. She first appears in the historical record in 1809 when she finally settles in New York. And I've gone through the Noel family history that documents their passage from Baltimore to Pennsylvania and then eventually New York City. Thank you. I just want to not forget, lose one thought too about what you just said. When you talked about the kinship networks and people saying, hey, you're going there. Can you just bring my gumbo? That feels very contemporary to me, by the way. I still feel like in terms of, you know, people, oh, you're going to Haiti. Will you bring this to my cousin or will you take this with me or will you do this? So that's a wonderful thing to just see how long those networks and relationships have been going. Here's a question to build um, for both of you. Um, Joanne Hippolyte writes, I'm curious about all the different archives consulted by each of the speakers for their research. Could each of them share again which ones they used for their work? And maybe talk a little bit about what it has meant for you to go into those archives and try to reconstruct um, these worlds, these Haitian women in diaspora spaces. Um, so I mainly used uh, the Beinecke uh, at Yale University. And um, I didn't initially go to look for this project. I was just going through um, the Langston News because again, I love Langston News. Of course, I'm like, this is amazing. And as I'm going through the photographs that he took in Haiti, I was really, it struck me that the women, the, I mean, there were other subjects and characters, but the, the women, especially that postcard of the, the naked woman in, in, in in the vegetation. And of course, going through this process as a Haitian person who grew up in Haiti, who when I go to Haiti to do research, I'm not sure I have the same access to the Haitian archives as other scholars who are not Haitian. Mm -hmm. it, it, it took me a moment. I had to sit down in this archive, like in this very fancy building where I'm thinking of all this material that are related to Haiti, but I have to go here. And here I have more access to it in a weird sense because there was, a, whereas like in my own country, outsiders, outside uh, researchers who are not Haitians, some tend to have doors open for them easy, more easily than me, who's the PTP, right? So I had to go through all of this process. And of course, I have to shout out d -Log, the Digital Library of the Caribbean. Of course, I cannot do the work I do without them. Um, and the piggyback off that, I, I think it's, it is interesting how you have these unofficial networks to get into archives, especially in, in Haiti. But I think it's also something we need to recognize is that archives are imperial spaces and spaces of colonialism. And we have to go to Yale or we go to New York Public Library where I went. Uh, you know, the Pierre Toussaint papers on microfilm are not even in the Schomburg Center. What does that have to say about the way our archives are constructed? Um, but I primarily use the um, Schomburg, the New York Public Library, Library Congress, and the BNF um, for research. I did trace uh, Pierre Toussaint's uh, former masters to um, Agen, France, which was very really interesting because I did research on the Leobichot family in Agen and they are interacting with Pierre Toussaint's former masters and things like that. So it's interesting to see this interesting diasporic connection beyond these notable uh, Haitian figures. Um, but those were the primary archives that I used. And um, I should also say that uh, the Maryland um, archives were fantastic during the pandemic uh, and they 
scanned a bunch of death certificates for me as well. Wow, I love the connection that you just made as well though, Andy, that the archive is an imperial space, but the archive is also a diasporic space. The archive is a diaspora space. So thinking about the relationship between those two things together is really powerful. I mean, and that's what I feel like is, is also coming through um, in terms of your presentation, Shana, in that, you know, like even those who are on a project of diaspora building, what is the relationship innately then between diasporic building? And which is also kind of like a pan, it's a nationalist project, a pan-nationalist project. How does that actually relate to imperialism, especially in terms of the treatment of women and the representation of women and gender and how that gets operated? So this becomes an interesting intersection. One thing I thought was interesting in your, your presentation, Andy, as well, is we see the entrepreneurial and the element to the women that you are studying, which is something that I associate when I think about market women. So even like uh, across class, there's something that I think often, at least in my communities, there's like a pride of Haitian women as being business minded, which seems to drop out in some of the representations of women in flora or women as the land, or women as, you know, so that became an interesting contrast as well. There are two specific questions here about your project, Shana. And so I wanna start with the first one here, which came early on and from someone, I think it's, um, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing this, Ramanja Alston. Can we open up a discussion of the role of patronage, specifically that of Charlotte Mason in the exotic representations of Haitian women by writers such as Langston Hughes and Zora Neale, excuse me, Zora Neale Hurston. So what would you have to say about this idea of white patronage and exotic representations of Haitian women? Great, thank you for that question. Um, yes, excellent question. I definitely should uh, dwell more and uh, spend more time with uh, on this. Um, I think smarter people have written about this. I'm thinking of Belle Rooks. I think she wrote about this. Um, but I know that where my project starts with Langston News going to Haiti, it's right after he loses the patronage of Mason. Mm -hmm. It's 1931. It's right before. And that was the impetus for him to take this trip. It's, the idea was that he was broke. He's going to Mexico and the Caribbean. So, but yeah, thank you for this question. I will um, think of it more as I keep going. And, um, and if other people have resources or not, because the people who are in this Zoom are geniuses. So if you have information, you have knowledge about any of the things that we're talking about, this is also a site for us to share. The, um, another question here for you, or um, I think this is a really exciting question. Jasmine Claude Narcisse writes, there seems to be no definite record of intimate relations between Langston Hughes and female partners. What could that gray area of his life and the recognition now that he was most likely gay contribute to our understanding of this particular collection of women's bodies? Yes, thank you, Jasmine, for this question. Again, excellent question. And I think it's one of these questions that makes me uncomfortable. Uncomfortable because as you said earlier, um, Gabriel, right? Langston News is such an icon, right? We, we are drawn to him. But now we have to sit and ask ourselves these difficult questions and, and um, look at his work, his archive, what he has left behind with a critical look, which makes us uncomfortable, right? And um, about uh, Langston News, sexuality and the representation of women, I'm thinking of how hetero, the heteropatriarchal order is upheld by not just straight men, and the white heteropatriarchal order is not just upheld by white heterosexual men. It's either members of the LGBTQ plus community, but also women uphold the, 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 the patriarchal order, black women also. So I think it's, this project is really about um, being okay with the, um, asking the uncomfortable question and like exploring these questions where we could question these icons, these, these, these figures of the black, uh, black diaspora who are icons and also put 
this work in conversation with previous work where again people who are smarter have done the work and shown how amazing uh um LinkedIn use the work that he had done in Haiti is right the fact that he he did focus on the the peasant, the Haitian peasantry compared to others who just looked at the uh the elite who whose eyes were turned to France and Europe right but I think we have to keep going and keep questioning and push uh the, the push the research forward but you thank you uh Jason. What a wonderful um, idea of just, so you can hold someone in esteem and still be critical. And in fact, we need to, we have to go deeper and push the research further. So I love that as one of the big energies around this whole conference. Um, one last thing that what you just said made me think of is like, what does it mean to idealize something? What does it mean to have an idealized version of like the woman in the fields, the woman, you know, as opposed to a more grounded idea. I feel like that also is playing into a romanticized notion um, that's a part of the project of pan-nationalism in some sense, represented by, you know, like a black woman with a with a baby in her arm, you know, so there's something there around gender. Um, I will add just one more thing that um, studying this project and sharing it because it's fairly new. I was very scared of the reception. I think it was people would just be like, you, how dare you talk about links and news this way? But uh, I'm glad that uh, I didn't get your reaction. Well, people are, I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for people. I'll say I'm very excited and I'm so thrilled. Um, and I have, I mean, I would love to talk even further later. We have another question for Dr. McGinn from Prudence Cumberbatch. Why do people go to Baltimore? Was it primarily a temporary stop? If not, how many people settled there and can be located as residents after the end of slavery? Um, Prudence Cumberbatch asked this because although Baltimore had a significant free black population, it was a slave state and involved complicated negotiations of that space. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, and just to piggyback also on the previous question, um, Pierre Toussaint is also a complicated figure when you examine him, very similar to Langston Hughes, where the only reason why his papers were saved was that when he died the year prior, Uncle Tom's Cabin comes out, and he was seen as a very Uncle Tom figure, and that's why his papers were preserved, uh, and these were preserved by his former masters um, that he donated to, and they were the patronage uh, for how he got all that real estate in New York. So that's a complicated, because that's the Hamilton family. He did the, the Hamilton sisters' hair, or the Schuyler sisters' uh, hair. Um, but the question about Baltimore is that uh, for those that were enslavers, Baltimore was ideal. I actually found this great letter at the Clements Library in University of Michigan, where a planter writes to his wife who served in the American Revolution, but lived in Saint-Domingue and was retreating from Saint-Domingue. And he says, we can't go to Philadelphia. You're not gonna find what you need there. Uh, we can't go to New Jersey. There's not a place to, to grow plants and slavery is kind of on the outs there because uh, we have gradual emancipation that's occurring there. We need to go to Baltimore because it has the land to grow crops and it has the laws to support the institution of slavery. And that's why you have a large master class that's going to Saint-Domingue with enslaved like Juliet. For those of free people of color, um, you're having um, Baltimore just being a hub during the Haitian Revolution where you could stow away, uh, you could purchase passage. It's just where the ships are going, um, aside from New York. You have also uh, a large population going to Charleston. And there's a Martinican uh, coffer, I can't remember his name, but there's a wonderful article about him in Philadelphia. And his family goes into Charleston around the time of Denmark Vesey's revolt, uh, you have a large Haitian population that move up to Baltimore and then they proceed to continue on to um, New York City. You also have uh, about 20 years later, a large New York population primarily filled with the friends of Toussaint's that go to New Orleans. So it's also, the, there's a lot of this movement of those of African descent, depending upon the laws and the situation in terms of rebellion, as well as finding a place to do business in black spaces. Um, 
And I would say that there is a fair amount of ways to track down this population in Baltimore. What's unfortunate is that the majority of those that were buried in the Catholic cemetery, their records uh, have been tarnished because the cemetery is no longer there. They destroyed the cemetery and moved the majority of the white bodies to the outskirts of Baltimore, uh, de demolishing a bunch of headstones. So I was very um, fortunate to find these individuals. And Fanny Montpensier lives to be 103 years old. And she's noted in the Baltimore health record. And that's the reason I was able to find her because she was just this remarkable person who lived so long uh, while several other people were lost in this, um, in this discussion. But the Baltimore directories are also all digitized and they're a fantastic source as well. Wow. That's amazing. And I'm, it's also amazing that all of that has been digitized. And even when, we, when you talked about the earlier archive, like the Caribbean archive, the digital archive of the Caribbean, just, the, just to try to increase that sort of access, but still recognizing how challenging it is for Haitian women to enter into the public record, um, enter into the archive and how creative uh, scholars, genealogists, artists have to be when entering into the archive to try to find the, the traces of who's there. We just have a few minutes left. Are there any other questions uh, or comments from the audience or for each other? If there was anything that you two wanted to ask each other or comment about your, your, um, your presentations? Um, I'd like to comment a little bit on your uh, discussion of how it's hard to find, especially black women within the archive of Haitian descent um, in a transnational sense. So America is extremely unique in the fact that you're having race in census records, race being marked in death records. My research of Haitians in France and the UK is extremely complicated. I found a Haitian family uh, in the workhouses of London um, in 1850, only by because I knew their full names. They're not noted as being people of color. Wow, that's, that's, thank you for noting that. Shauna, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yes, I'll just, um, I don't know which question that's uh, tied to, just thinking of uh, the, I think the second other, biography of LinkedIn News where he talks about finding Africa in Haiti. I think that's an important thing that um, that I've mentioned in the work that I should bring to the conversation, just that that as in, as part of this racial solidarity, there is also this distancing that's happening that, yes, we're all Black, we're all in this together, but you Haitians are closer to Africa, whereas African-Americans, not as much, right? But yeah, that's all. Thank you. Well, the power of the revolution and the lore of the revolution. I mean, and so prior to the revolution, the people who would come to call themselves Haitians did experience enslavement. I mean, but there's something about the idea, but here are the people who found a way to, to turn that around. And so, um, but there is some notion of primitivism, of course, that's built into that. And I feel like um, when, when we look at the negritude poets, and when we look, I mean, and for me, that's really, I feel like Langston Hughes is, is really there with um, Senghor or somebody. I mean, there's a, there's, a roman there's a romance that he's interested in living to lift him up away from the abjection of being Black in the United States and being able to herald to an amazing past. So then everything, it's like the projection of that past onto whatever it is that he's seeing in the present. And the lack of the language then allows that to be a kind of blank screen for him perhaps. And it's one of admiration and I would argue, or I mean, I haven't been in the archives, so I wanna believe at least that there's, a, there's admiration there um, or desire for love or connection, but it's idealized, which means it may or may not actually be what, what is happening for the people that are there. And that's something I think um, that's really important for us to think about at that intersection of Haitian studies and Africana studies. Right, right. It's like Haiti is almost an empty symbol that it's all—it's never been able to capture as it is. It's just like it's being things are being put on top of it. It's either the 
the Haitian revolution and that's all. Haitian, Haiti is reduced to that or Haiti is pushed towards Africa, but like the actual um, lived reality of Haiti is always like um, um, slippery. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw one comment here that I just wanted to read aloud here, and it has to do about Baltimore. And Vermanja R. Alston writes, it's interesting to note that Baltimore slave port of Fells Port continued to serve as slave, excuse me, slave ships at a time when Haitians were arriving as free people of color. Fells, Fells Point, excuse me. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure that that was read. Um, unless anyone has anything else, I think it might be time for us to bring our session to a close. Um, Dr. Marie-Lily Serra writes, in Haiti, we see all tourists, white, black, and so on, as étranger, visitor. Félix Maurice Olewa may have wanted to capture that in his poem. Wow, I love that we get to end on the poem and the poet Félix, the great poet Félix Maurice Olewa. Thank you so much for these rich, beautiful presentations. Um, again, Dr. Shana Jean-Baptiste, Dr. Andrew W. McGinn, and I'm Gabrielle Seville. Um, this was the panel, Haitian Women in Diasporic Spaces, and the conference now will take a break from 12.30 to one o'clock. If you are really, I guess it'll end up being 12.20 to one o'clock in the Eastern time zone. Please come back at one o'clock for the next panel, which will be Haiti and Savannah, Georgia, a round table discussion. Thank you so, so much and um, have a wonderful rest of the conference. That was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Andrew, Ga Gabrielle, that was a wonderful way to begin. Oh my God, so, so cheers. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. The panels Michael. were awesome, right? My, oh my. You were so good. Hey, um, oh that was great. Um, I just wanted to alert you to the fact that- um, We're still live on YouTube so they can yeah, hear us. Yeah, I know. But um, that uh, panelists I can- cannot pose questions to Q&A. Host and panelists seem not to be able to post, which is why I posted my questions in the chat. Um, I also posted for um, Shauna um, some information. You know, I've been to the Beinecke, <laughs> but there, there, there are, you know, I spend a lot of time in the Beinecke, but there's a lot of Langston Hughes work in George Houston Bass's collection at Brown, okay. because when George Houston Bass died, um, the people who went in to clean out his house found all this Langston Hughes material. That's awesome. <laughs> I did see, and we did see it in the chat, that comment. So hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Then um, Lily, you're gonna save the chats, aren't you? Um, yes, our technicians, are responsible okay. to save everything that can, that come through that came through. Yeah, I'm I'm saving them. Okay. okay, I have to run myself. I have a recording session that I'm doing, but I wanted to thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of the conference. My God, what a great! We knew Jai and I are texting into this was the perfect person. For oh, the that's so thank kind. You. I'm sorry. I want to make sure that I say your name properly. Is it Vermanja? Yes, it is. You got. I it. did it right. Okay, because yeah. I hate to mispronounce someone's name, but I always want to say who it's coming from, yeah. so great. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for those questions and for those comments. Hi, yeah. Gabriel. This is Gerard from graduate school. Gerard! Yeah, how are I've you? I haven't seen you in one million years. Oh my God. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I still so have that. Is a course member on the Nickley Tube. Yeah, yes. I'm trying to get my, my face to show. There I am. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's been you a know, million years. Yeah, it's all those you look exactly years. the same. Oh my God, God, that's you amazing. Too. You, you, you even look better, by the way. <laughs> Remember you used to wear the glasses in graduate oh, school? Well, I'll take that. <laughs> I know. And I, I saw your performances. Glasses. I saw your, yeah, I know the little round glasses. Yeah. I saw your performances online. I didn't know that you had gone on to, to doing beautiful work. Excellent. 
Oh, so, thank yeah. you so much. Where are you located right now, Gerard? I'm, I'm in France, in the Southwest. I've been living here 20 years, 20, yeah, 20 years, yeah. Well, I'll be in France at the Baldwin Conference in Nice in oh, June. Oh, wow, so that's great. Send, yeah, I go to Nice in the chat twice a year, yeah. So we can, maybe we because can hook up. That okay. would be amazing. I know we're still live, everyone on YouTube. We're, yeah. we're yeah. this is part of the, this is yeah. how kinship works. This is well, the network. This, this is, is also how work. conferences work. People meet in the hallway. I had another comment for Andrew Magin. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I, you know, I spent part of my childhood in Baltimore. <laughs> So I, I know that geography very well, which is why I raised the question about Fells Point, you know, it, it's the slave port.